It's always a little tricky with a mask and one of these on at the same time. So uh, let me begin by telling you a little bit about last weekend. My family and I last weekend, we watched a Disney movie. And it, sometimes it seems to me that they often kind of end in the same way, don't they? This uh, young woman meets this young man, and at first they don't get along, they don't see eye to eye, but then they go through some adventures, they have some struggles, and eventually they wind up falling in love and living happily ever after. You know, I don't mind those endings. The only problem is they don't seem to fit very well with my wife, you know? The struggle seems a little bit more real, a lot longer than they tend to struggle, normally a day or two for them, a lot longer. And sometimes the fairy tale ending seems nearly impossible. We're in a sermon series right now in the book of Hosea called Relentless Love. And today, in the chapter we're looking at today, we're going to see that um, this actually closes uh, a certain story, the humiliating record of Hosea and Gomer's struggle in their marriage. Even though the book is going to continue on, this closes that story. This is in their story is the furthest thing from a fairy tale, love, and romance that you can imagine. You see, if you'll remember, God came to Hosea, the prophet, and he told her to marry a prostitute. And unsurprisingly, she was unfaithful to him. But their struggles, the struggles that they would have, would tell the story of God's love for his unfaithful people in a way that words never could. See, his real-life family struggles became a profound expression of God's love for you and for me. So as we go through this, I hope that we'll see that how far God is willing to go out of love for us. We'll see how beautiful his redemption of us is on the cross. And I hope also we'll find that no matter how far we've wandered, we can always have hope in his love for us. I pray that this morning we're going to see that Hosea and Gomer's story so long, long ago has so much to teach us today about the love of God for his people. Now, let's just, before we begin to this, just briefly commend our time to the Lord in prayer. God, we come before you. We pray that you would enliven your words, empower them by the Spirit, open our hardened hearts. Let each one of us hear from you this morning. We came here because we want to hear from you. And God, if someone came for other reasons, we pray, Lord, that you would awaken their heart this morning as well. Give us ears to hear and speak to us from your word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So, what, let's start out by rereading the first verse. The first verse of Hosea 3. You can follow along in your Bible, whether that's on a phone or a hard copy, or you can follow along on the screen. It says this, And the Lord said to me, Go again. Love a woman who's loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. When Gomer left Hosea and time passed, he probably thought that painful chapter of his life had finally come to a close. But God had other plans for his prophet. God tells him, go again. Love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress. See, in this statement, it says again, because God is emphasizing that her unfaithfulness wasn't just a one-time mistake, but was a consistent pattern. See, Hosea has to be fearful. Returning to her is just giving her the opportunity to hurt him and humiliate him all over again. And God says that she is loved by, ano loved by another man. And that's present tense. So that means that as he's saying this, she is, she's doing that at the moment. And finally, he doesn't sugarcoat her guilt. He says that she is an adulteress. Basically, God is saying, I am asking you to go back to the woman who has hurt and humiliated you time and time again. And she's doing it even as I ask right now. She's with another man. But I want you to go back to her anyway. See, that God had to command Hosea to love her again gives us, strongly implies that Hosea had stopped loving her. 
and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that we can understand that. This was really hard for Hosea to hear, but sometimes the right thing to do is the hardest thing to do, and he's called to love his wife. In this way, Hosea's love becomes a reflection of God's love. You see, it's not that Hosea looked up at God and said, hey, you kind of love like I do, but that God looked down at Hosea and commanded him, you must love her like I do. See, Derek Kidner said this. He said the love, the love that was asked of Hosea would be heroic, but that was the point. For it was the love of it was to be God's love in miniature. See, God intends Hosea's love to teach us about his own love for unfaithful sinners like you and me. It's interesting that God commands Hosea to go, to, to, to take the initiative and do something. You know, normally when someone's hurt me, I want to wait for them to come cringing back to me apologetically. But God calls us to a love that doesn't wait, but goes forward. Doesn't wait for the person even to be sorry, but reaches out to them, reaches out with reconciliation. He calls us to that kind of love because that's how he loves us, isn't it? I mean, when we first became Christians, if you're a Christian, you know this. When you first became a Christian, he didn't, it wasn't that you went out and you found God. He sought, searched for you and he found you in his love. Isn't that exactly what Jesus was talking about in Luke chapter 15 when he told the parable of the lost coin and the lost sheep? See, in, that, in the parable of the lost coin, there was this lady, and she lost a coin in her house. And so she swept and cleaned and searched everywhere until she finally found that lost coin. And with the lost sheep, there was a shepherd. He owned 100 sheep. One of them wandered off and got lost. And so he left behind his 99 sheep and he searched until he found that lost sheep. And, he, and when he found it, he picked it up, he put it on his shoulders and he carried the sheep home. And in both cases, upon finding what was lost, they celebrated and called their friends together and were very, very happy. In these two parables have some similarities. They have things that they want to teach us. In both cases, it shows us that the thing that is lost is valuable to the one who lost it, right? Uh, coins today are nothing. It's just change for us. But back then, they didn't have bills. Coins were really valuable. That's why she looked so diligently. She searched and she searched until she found it. She couldn't afford not to find it. And, and in the case of the shepherd, if he left 99 sheep just to find one sheep, we know that he valued that sheep. And their response upon finding it, their celebration, teaches us too that they must have valued that thing as well. See, these parables teach us that the thing lost is valuable, but they also teach us and challenge how we normally think about our state of lostness. You see, we tend to think if we're lost, it's our responsibility to find our own way back, that we have to work at becoming unlost, that it's up to us to become found. But I like these parables because they, they give the opposite. See, a coin can't find itself. And that sheep, it not only can't find its way back, but when it is found, it needs to be carried back. It can't do it on its own. These parables, they teach us about our helplessness, that we must be sought out and found by a loving God. You know, I remember when I was just a child, we ha I was in church, and we had this speaker, and he came, and he was teaching, on the parables of Luke 15, and he brought out this stuffed lamb. And he said, how do you think the shepherd responded when he finally found that lamb? Did he look at it and he say, oh, I have been looking everywhere for you. My back is sore, my feet are sore. You have gotten so lost. You dumb lamb, you better not do that again. You think he did that? I, when I was a kid, I think you're shocked, but I broke out laughing because it was so obviously not the way he would respond. He went searching for that lamb because he loved that lamb, didn't he? He picked that lamb up with love. He put it on his own shoulders. He carried it back home. And when he got home, he rejoiced because he was so glad to find his lost sheep. That's true of us too, isn't it? 
You know, it doesn't matter how down and out you are, how far and how long you have been away from God, how steeped in sin and guilt you feel this morning. You still have a God who loves you and will leave the 99 and come searching for the one. Do you see that this morning? His love isn't quenched by your sinfulness, your unfaithfulness, your waywardness. God still loves you. He is pursuing you right now. Hosea is going to go and he's going to find his wife. He's going to bring her back home. God wants to do that with you. He wants to do that with you today. The question is, will you let him? Will you let him do that? I want us to see that God's love is a, re is a relentless love. It does not give up on us, even when we've given up on him, even when we're running from him. He still pursues us out of love. See, this relentless love is compared to the people's fickle, inconsistent love at the second half of verse 1, as it continues and said that as uh, it's talking about how, God, how Hosea is called to love Gomer, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. See, this painful comparison really highlights the huge gap between how God loves his people and his people, how they turn to other gods and his people love. They love cakes of raisins. As far as we can tell, cakes of raisins were delicacies, special treats that they would bring out, and they would often use them in association with worship of idols. That was common that they would, idol, they would worship idols, and that worship would involve things that would appeal to their appetites and their desires. And Hosea is highlighting that aspect of idol worship, just to just emphasize how frivolous the things are that they are out there pursuing and their hearts are drawn to. How could they choose raisin cakes over a God that loves them like this? But before we condemn them too harshly, it would do us well to take stock of our own lives and our own hearts, and to see for what empty and foolish things we leave and turn from our God, things that we love more than we love our gods. Because you see, whenever you fall into sin and you choose to sin, in that moment you are saying, I love this sin more than I love obeying and following my Lord and God. And our real lives and where we spend our energy reveal that our dedication is not spread or not first to God, but often we are following other things in our lives, aren't we? You know, some of us that are parents, we are more dedicated to seeing our children be successful than to seeing them become godly. You know, if you spend all your time taxiing them around to this program and that program so that they can get high grades and be well-rounded, but you are not cracking your Bible with them, having family devotions with them and nurturing their souls, then that reveals that you care more about worldly success than you do about God. Some people, when they retire, well, you can tell where their heart really belongs by what they spend all their time on, can't you? And then sometimes, young people particularly, but we can all do this, we say to ourselves, God, I, 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 gotta, I gotta take a break from you for a little bit. I really gotta focus on this thing. But after this thing is done, after I take care of it, then I'm gonna spend time with you. Then I'm gonna start reading my Bible. Then I'm gonna pray again. But right now, I'm just too busy. And the thing is, you said that last month, and you said that last semester, and you said that last year. When are you gonna see that the thing that you spend all your time and energy on is the thing that you're really serving, the thing that you really care about? And all that thing is just God talk. It's empty. See, Israel loved raisin cakes. They loved trivialities. Things unworthy of their dedication and their devotion. What are your raisin cakes? I don't mean that literally. But what are the things? If, if Hosea were writing about you, what would he have said that you love more than you love God? How would it have compared to how God loves you? What immensely less significant thing are you devoting your time and energy to while well, God just wants your heart back? See, we chase after shadows and mist, and God patiently pursues us. When you think about that, don't you think, how much greater is God seeing that he pursues sinners like us? who are so unworthy and foolish and so caught up with so many other things. 
You know, honestly, if you were in Hosea's position, would you chase after Gomer? Or would you have said enough is enough? What about God? If you were God, would you keep chasing after you? Would you keep chasing after a raisin cake loving sinner who seems to go after every other thing and God always tends to come up last, get the remainder of the day, get the leftovers? See, I pray that as we think about our unfaithfulness, it isn't so much guilt that I want to bring up, but it is awe that we have a God with such a relentless love that he will not stop. No matter how far we come short, he will not give up on us. He keeps pursuing us and pursuing us, and we get a chance and another chance and another chance, and he comes after us. May we praise him for that relentless love, because we need it, don't we? We need it. Let's look at verse 2 again and see how this story continues. It says this, So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lethic of barley. See, that verse comes as a huge surprise after verse 1 because we discover that Gomer is now a slave, right? I mean, in the ancient world, the only people that you could buy were slaves, not free people. You couldn't buy them. So somewhere along the line, Gomer's become a slave. And that's strange because back in verse 1, it said that she is loved by another man. We wouldn't have expected her to be a slave. But obviously, the word love here in this verse has a lot of different meanings. It ranges from God's relentless love for us to Israel's love of things like raisin cakes. And probably this love by another man is more on that range. It's probably euphemistic for how she was using Gomer, how he was using Gomer, sorry, at this time. And so, uh, last we read, we found that Gomer was a prostitute. And we might ask, what happened to her to further reduce her? To this state of slavery? We can't be sure because the text doesn't give us a lot of answers, but we can make some guesses. We know that she was working as a prostitute and she might have become involved with the wrong people in that profession and they forced her into a prostitution ring. Many young women are fooled, kidnapped, and enslaved in this way even today, and it is a horrific, horrific injustice. But, you know, based on understanding the time Gomer was living in, most scholars actually think it's more likely that Gomer fell into debt, and in order to pay off that debt, she was forced to sell herself into slavery. Now, a lot of people, when they imagine the scene of, of Hosea going to buy Gomer, they imagine almost like an auction scene, the slave market, and Gomer standing there and Hosea v bidding in. It's kind of unlikely. Probably this has been there for a while, and she's either owned by someone privately, or I tend to think that she was bought up by one of the temple complexes to Baal, and she is serving there, enslaved as a temple prostitute, the very institution that Hosea spent so much time railing against. However, no matter how she got there, and we're not sure, she's obviously hit rock bottom here, hasn't she? Some of you are going to wonder if we should spend more time talking about Gomer's story, because obviously, in some sense, she is a victim here, even if she left a good man behind. But... We have to remember that this story isn't really about Gomer, is it? She represents Israel. And Israel are the people of God. We are the people of God today too. So in a way, she represents us. And so the more information we were to find about Gomer's story, the less that mo metaphor would really work. And so it's kind of silent. It's the same with Hosea. You might wonder, well, how does he feel about all this? Well, it's kind of silent about that, isn't it? Because I bet you Hosea has a lot of conflicted feelings about it all. But Hosea is to represent God, who doesn't have conflicted feelings about it. And so, uh, it's got to keep a light on his details, too. Because this story, in order for it to reveal God's tender heart for his unfaithful people, we're going to have to be satisfied with three meager verses about this very dramatic chapter in Hosea and Gomer's life. In this story, we discover Hosea obviously tracks Gomer down. He goes to her owner. And he buys her back. And the word there in the original for buy implies that there was some pretty hard bargaining that went on there. Can you imagine having to haggle for your own wife's life? That would have been hard. I remember I did a fair bit of bargaining when I was in China. And full disclosure, I am terrible at it. My dad is good. I am bad at bargaining. But I picked up a few basics along the way. When you're bargaining, it's a pretty good idea to question the quality of the thing you're looking to buy, right? And that way to try to drive the price down. If I'm going to buy a coat, I might be like, oh, well, you know, I've got a few already. A coat, 
color is okay. It doesn't really go with what I'm wearing. And, you know, it's kind of thin. I don't know. I'll give you this much. You know, you try like that, right? It's also a really good idea to go in already knowing how much the thing costs, about how much it should cost, and knowing how much the maximum is you're willing to pay. But I learned this. Above all else, never let the person you're, you're bargaining with know how much you want to buy it, right? Because if you do, they're surely going to rip you off. Look at Hosea here. It's a dead giveaway. He's coming to buy his own wife back. The buyer would have known he was desperate and would have made him pay big time. And it looks like by how Hosea paid this mix of money and food that he's barely able to scrounge up the cost in order to get his wife back. But he pays the price so Gomer can be his again. He buys her back. If you think about it, his love for Gomer has already cost him so much, but it costs him even more in this moment, but he pays it. And this represents God. That's why we Christians, we love to talk about redemption, don't we? Because to redeem something means to buy back what belongs to you. And here, Hosea's redeeming Gomer represents God redeeming us. We learn that God's love isn't just relentless. It's redeeming, too. Now, we realize why Hosea had to go and find Gomer, right? He couldn't wait. He had to go because she couldn't go to him. She was enslaved. You might wonder, well, why is it so important that Hosea wants to emphasize that Gomer was a slave in this moment? Is he trying to humiliate her? No, 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 no. This is a picture of us. This represents us, separated from God's love and enslaved to sin. That's how the Bible describes us. That, that without Christ, we are slaves to sin. We are sold out to sin. It has mastery over us. We can't stop it. We can't stop sinning. We can't live in true righteousness. We're slaves. Sin is our master. But um, in John 8.34, Jesus said this, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. See, Jesus didn't just say that we're slaves. He said that slaves don't remain in the house forever. Well, what house? He's talking about God's house, heaven. And he's giving a terrible warning here. He's saying that those who are still enslaved to their sin have no hope of living in God's heaven forever, but only to be cast out into the outer darkness of hell. See, Gomer couldn't free herself from the hell of slavery she was living in. She needed to be redeemed. Her debt needed to be paid before she could go free. And Hosea came along and he paid that debt for her. Like Gomer, we can't free ourselves from our slavery to sin. It isn't about trying more. It isn't about doing more. It isn't about resolutions. Like Gomer, we can't redeem ourselves. It's not about what we can do. It's about what Christ has already done. See, on the cross, he redeemed us by giving his own life, by shedding his own blood. He paid the price of our sins. He freed us indeed from our slavery. As Ephesians 1, 7 says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Christ did it all. It's already been accomplished. Our redemption is complete. All that is left for you to do is believe. Turn from your sin. Turn in faith to one who died for you. Turn to a God who loved you enough to pay the great price of sending his son to bleed on a cross and suffer the guilt of your sins. He gave his life to redeem you and make you his own. Now maybe, maybe you've heard this all before, but you're just sitting there and you're still not sure. You're sitting on the fence yet. I want to urge you not to stay in that state. Don't let a love like this pass you by. Don't let a redemption like this that is offered go by and let it pass. Because the consequences of that decision would be terrible. And missing out on an opportunity like this would be the epitome of foolishness. Instead, be freed 
through the cross of Christ. Don't delay. Even now where you're sitting, put your faith in Christ and He can save you. Because God's love is a redeeming love. Won't you let Him redeem you? Let's read the remainder of this short story. It continues. We'll read verses 3 to 5. And I said to her, You must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. So will I also be to you. For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household gods. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. And they shall come in to, they shall come in fear to the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. Gomer belongs to Hosea now, but does, has she just come into a new slavery? I mean, what about her agency, her choice? Does she get a say in all of this? And what if Hosea only bought her to be vengeful, you know, brutal, force his love upon her? She's been used by many men, and now she's just been traded like she's livestock. Is she simply become Hosea's slave as she just got a new slave master now. So, you know, you know, well, there's not a lot of information in verse 3. There's enough here for us to draw some definite conclusions on how this story might come to an end. You see, after, after Hosea redeemed Gomer, he made some demands of her. He begins by saying to her, you must dwell as mine for many days, which if you think about it is a pretty strange thing to say to a slave, isn't it? Normally, you don't tell slaves, You've got to stay with me for many days. You force them to stay with you for life. But um, maybe something else is going on here. See, Hosea continues and he says, you shall not play the whore, a translation I am no fan of. The original simply says, you must not be a prostitute. That's what he's saying to her. See, at very least, that tells us that Hosea has no plans of selling her off to men like her last uh, owner. So her position has improved a little bit, at least. And then he says, you can't belong to another man. And that's euphemism to say you can't sleep around. Now, actually, I don't like the NIV's translation here. Most other translations put it a little differently. NIV has made an interpretation to say another man. The original text does not say another. It just says a man or any man. And uh, so what Hosea is saying is that... Um, He's, gonna not be, he's not going to, to force himself upon her either. So um, Hosea's bought her back. It's obviously not out of lust, not out of that kind of cruelty that she's been subjected to. But then why is he buy her back? Like, what, what is she now? Is he just going to force her to be a celibate slave or a uh, scorned wife? And how long are these many days? Maybe most importantly, who decides when these many days come to an end? Well, the next phrase turns everything on its head as he says, so will I also be to you. See, saying that means this is no longer the language of a master and a slave. See, there's no reciprocity there. There's, there's no equal rights. There's no mutual responsibility. This is something entirely different. This is moved from the language of slavery to the language of marital vows. See, he is saying that they are moving toward one another here. And that semicolon that begins it all means his statement applies to everything. And if it applies to everything, it means when he says, you, will dwell, you must dwell as mine for many days, he's also saying, I also will dwell as yours for many days. We belong to each other. It's not a statement of ownership and cruelty. It's a statement of love. And then he says that this has got to be an exclusive marriage. You know, no more prostitution, no more adultery. But also, just as you're not going to be sleeping with any man, I'm not going to have eyes for anyone else either, even after all that you've done to me and against me. And this reciprocity language really implies that those many days will end if and only if they both come to an agreement to come back together. A mutual agreement there. See, Hosea is wisely giving them time to rebuild their marriage 
and heal old wounds before they even think about any kind of intimacy. And they're going to wait until they're ready. He's going to take time to win back his wife's heart. Far from being bought by a cruel new master, she has been redeemed by a loving, respectful, patient, and gentle husband. Hosea is loving his wife again, and he's giving her the opportunity and choice to love him back. Like he's wiping the slate clean. Almost like if his marriage, it's like he's rebooting it like a computer, completely clearing the memory and starting it off completely fresh. And from this we're learning that God's love, it's not just relentless and redeeming. God's love is renewing too, isn't it? Just like Hosea renewed his love. We have a forgiving God. A God that doesn't just give us second and third chances, but a thousandth chances. He's patient and kind with us. And he builds us back up when we've fallen. He, he restores us when we come back into his arms. See, let's see how Hosea connects this with Israel in verses 4 and 5. In verse 4 he says, um, for the children of Israel, this is the conclusion he draws from his own story, for the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household gods. Um, and uh, here we're seeing that if they don't have kings or princes, then they've lost their, their national independence, haven't they? He's warning them once more that Assyria is going to come and going to conquer them and take them away into exile. But he's also giving them hope in the middle of that. Because in the tragedy of their exile, in the horror of what they're going to go through in exile, they're going to unlearn all those sinful patterns they developed. They're going to be free from all those things that reinforced and tempted them into sin. You see, kings and princes had been terrible influences upon the nation. But they're not going to have them any longer, at least for some time. And then they've been mixing their sacrifices to God with those idolatrous pillars that they used to worship Baal. But they're not going to have either of those off in exile. And finally, they had been wearing priestly ephods, the garment of a priest, at the same time having household gods back at home. But that will come to an end. Their worship had been polluted, but God is pulling them out of that. He's giving them a clean break from all those practices so that they can unlearn the sinful habits and learn to love and live for their God again. And afterward, they would learn. Because we read that afterward, the children of God shall return. See, this time it won't just be God seeking and finding them. They're going to be seeking their God as well. They're going to seek the Lord their God, aren't they? And they aren't seeking Him, as we read last time in chapter 2, where, where it's just seeking to use, seeking for what they could get. No, no, they're seeking Him for different reasons. They're seeking the Lord for David their king which is a strange statement when you think about it, because David's been dead for a few hundred years. And actually, Hosea is serving in the kingdom of northern Israel. They had rejected David's descendants as kings. They had rebelled against them and set up their own kingly line. So they're going to seek David their king? Well, this not only implies a, some kind of a coming union between northern and southern Israel, but it also implies more than a, it's, it's more than a political union because David is specifically talked about. You see, David was promised that his descendant would rule over Israel forever. This was a messianic promise. And one day there is a descendant of David, Jesus Christ, who saved his people and united them with all the people of the world by dying on the cross and making them one people. And then he also resurrected afterward, and he now rules and reigns from heaven on high. And he is the one who provides a way so that they can come, it says, in fear to the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. See, this fear isn't a cowering terror or a knee-knocking dread. This is what we often call reverence. Because they knew that while they were coming, to the holy creator and judge of the universe, in coming to him, they were also coming to his goodness. Do you see how it says that? They knew that their, their God was a good God. 
They knew that because they knew he was one who loved them with a relentless love. A love that kept pursuing them, though they, they failed, they turned, they were unfaithful time and time again. They knew he was one who had a love for them that was a redeeming love. One who paid the price for their sin so that they might come to him in the first place. And they knew that they were coming to one who loved them with a renewing love. Who would wash them from their filth. Who would pick them back up. Who would be gentle and patient with them. And would teach them to love him once more. See, that gave them great, great hope. If, if this is the beautiful message that lays behind the story of the struggles of Hosea and Gomer's marriage, don't you wonder how their own story ends? You wonder that? I'm one of those people, when I watch a movie, I need to watch it to the very end, no matter how bad and how painful that movie is, or a book, I'm the same way. I just need to know how the story ends. And here... I have to wonder, what about Hosea and Gomer? It just stops telling us about them. How does their story end? Do you wonder that? I wonder that. Maybe it's just me. But I think that we can draw some conclusions. You see, as Gomer represented Israel throughout this story, I think we can guess that she responds like Israel will also respond. Think about it. Her bubble had been burst. She'd hit rock bottom. She didn't want that lifestyle anymore. And we can see also that Hosea comes along, her old husband, and he shows her his goodness, doesn't he? He frees her from slavery, he redeems her, and he doesn't bring her back to cruelty, to finger wagging, to shame, but to a loving embrace. How could she not give in to a love like that? A man who had loved her so patiently, so sufferingly, so greatly for so long. Even, even in the fact that he gives her time, he gives her space to work things out, to get her heart set right again. His gentleness and patience are amazing. I believe that a love like that could soften even the hardest of hearts. And I truly am convinced that in the end, in the end, Gomer gives her heart finally to Hosea too. You see, my question for you this morning is this. What about you? If this was the story of God's relentless love for you, how is that story going to end? Will you cling to things that can't satisfy, things that are empty, things even that wind up enslaving you to them? Will you hold out and reject God's offered love to you forever? Or, if you're a believer having experienced that love, but maybe you've wandered off, you've fallen into sin, you've become cold and distant, and you're not really feeling it anymore, will you let the guilt and the fear and the coldness keep you from returning to God because you're not sure how he's going to receive you? That's you. Learn the lessons that Gomer learned. God is relentless. He hasn't given up on you. He is pursuing you even now. And there is still hope. He will renew you in His love. All that you have to do is return to that amazing love, to a love like that. Right now, right now, where you are sitting, I want you to know that God is offering that love to you. He's offering it right now. Maybe you've never accepted Christ. What's holding you back? Why not turn? Why not receive him as your Savior? Why not let him pay the price for your sins for you since you couldn't? Why not put your faith in him? Repent of sin and be saved. Maybe you've fallen into sin. You're feeling awful this morning. You're feeling distant. Or you're, feel, you're, you're just here. You're checked out. You're here because someone brought you. You kind of wish you weren't. But you know it's not right. You know you're not feeling it. Why not turn back to him? Why not come back to the one? He's not going to receive you with shame. He's going to receive you with an open embrace. He's going to make it gentle and patient. He's going to do it right. Will you come back to him? I urge and implore you this morning to return to a God that loves you like that. In fact, right now I'm going to pray. 
if you want, you can make the words of my prayer your own. Maybe you've never been saved. If you pray along with me, the prayer isn't a magic bullet, but if you really internalize and make the words your own, they are your, it's your prayer to God himself. You can turn and accept him and be saved for your sake. Or if you're distant from God, why not get back? Why not get back today? Make a dedication. You know what? If you do that, if you pray along with me and you mean it, tell somebody about it. I'd love to hear. This is good news. If you're a believer and you're setting yourself right, tell another person. Get the accountability you need. Don't do it alone. Walk with fellow believers in fellowship. Let's turn. I encourage you, make these words your own, even as we turn to God in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we, we see the incredible struggle between Gomer and Hosea. And as we look at Gomer, we She's not very lovable. She isn't very faithful. She used Hosea. She thought nothing of his love and his care. And she hurt him time and time again. She turned away from him. She used him. She left him time and time again for this and for that. For, for men that were so much less than that good, good man. For empty things, for frivolities. It's like us. And when we see her sold in slavery nothing to offer, no way out, no way to save herself. We see ourselves there. And God, before you, we have no hope. Before you, we stand condemned and guilty for our sin. You are a holy, perfect, and righteous God, and we are unholy. We are imperfect. Sometimes we do the right thing, but it's so tarnished by all the, the dark things, not only that we do, but that we feel, that we think, that we want. We are sinful to the core. We don't just need a new attitude. We need a new heart. A new, we need to be renewed in Christ. We need to be washed clean. God, thank you so much that Christ came upon the cross. He paid the just punishment that you have for my sin. He paid it all on the cross. I don't have to do anything. I just have to turn and believe. Right now, God, I repent of my sin. I turn away from that. I don't want that anymore. I want you. Father, I take Christ's death in my place. I take him as my Savior right now. I take him as my Lord. And if I've done so already, and I've wandered, I'm steeped in sin, lost in it. I can't seem to stop the sin that I'm struggling with. I can't seem to be faithful. I keep messing up. Father, at this time, I surrender my life to you once more. I turn from that sin. A part of me, I admit, loves it. But I love you more because you love me infinitely more. I surrender to your love. I give my life once more to you, O oh God. May I serve you. May I give a little bit back of all that you have done for me. The least that I can do is love you in return. How can I be loved like this and not be moved? If my heart remains cold, even through all of this, if I feel nothing, God, change my heart, I pray. Make the stony heart soft. God, we commend ourselves to you now because your love is relentless. It's redeeming and it's renewing. We want to return to your love. We pray this in Jesus' name.